Hello YouTube. Uh, this video is going to be about one of the reasons I think the right has a disadvantage in its competition with the left for influence in American society. And that is the right's lack of something like what on the left is called an SJW, or a social justice warrior. And I'll get to exactly what I mean by that in a moment, but first I want to talk about the current state of things with respect to race in the United States, uh, using that issue as a case study of the problem that I'm going to describe, even though several other issues could be used just as well. Things that have happened relatively recently in the United States include the Kentucky governor talking about how he wants to expand health care coverage to 100% of blacks in the state, but not saying something equivalent about expanding it to 100% of whites. Uh, this is a fairly extraordinary thing, because he's actually literally talking about black people having a right to health care that white people don't have, so rights systematically differing by race. There was a story, I think a couple years ago now, in Connecticut, which I think is worth bringing up as well, in which some students were videoed saying the N-word, and they got in trouble not only at school, but also legally, because in Connecticut there are actual hate speech laws governing what people can say, although obviously you're not going to see people going and getting in legal trouble for saying something that is uh, anti-white. And of course, as I'm sure everyone knows, in Minneapolis, the city council is vowing to disband the police force because the police force had uh, an incident that they interpreted as being racist, even though there was no evidence uh, for that conclusion. And as I'm sure everyone knows already, in corporate America and in the education system in this country, uh, you will be fired or expelled if you oppose anti-white ideology openly. And companies and schools go out of their way to discriminate against white people in terms of hiring decisions, promotions, admissions to schools. Of course, on social media, you will be banned for opposing anti-white ideology. Anti-white ideology has become mainstream in the United States, and Republican elites have been ineffectual at stopping this uh, to the degree that they care, and to a great extent, they just don't care. The point here is that things have gotten pretty bad. Uh, the right has lost on this issue spectacularly, and it is not speculation about the future to say that they are going to come for your rights. They are coming for your rights in a practical sense right now. Uh, they are already limiting your opportunity in education and employment, etc., on the basis of your race. To some degree, it is not obvious to everyone that this already is important because they don't see what white people's lives would be like in the absence of these forces. And this is all happening while white people are still the majority of the country. It is obviously going to be, at least we can say probably, much worse uh, when white people are a minority in this country. It is headed in a very bad direction. I mean, it really is incredible that it is already this bad while we are still the majority. That should make anyone take this seriously, take this as something that is not just about an internet discussion, uh, some fun political nerd shit, that this is something that is uh, affecting people in the real world and is going to impact people in the real world even more going forward. And so you should... I think really care about the fact that we are losing so dramatically on this kind of issue. And if we care about the fact that we're losing on this, then we ought to want to know why we're losing. Uh, and this is not the only reason, but I think one of the reasons has to do with the relationship between the right and the left on the one hand and good and evil on the other. So uh, it is not an original observation of mine to note that the right tends to say that the left is primarily wrong, right? They're just factually incorrect, they're confused, maybe they're even stupid rather than them being fundamentally evil people. And by contrast, obviously, the left goes around painting right-wingers as fundamentally evil people. Uh, they're also wrong, but they're both wrong and evil. You can do both at once. Now, uh, the right also says that you should fight the left at the polls and at the polls really only. By contrast, the left says that if you know someone in your personal life, a coworker, a friend, a family member who, you know, uh, perpetuates patriarchal norms, who perpetuates uh, homophobic norms, transphobic norms, racist norms. A again, this could be applied to a whole bunch of issues. You cannot be silent and just let them do it. Silence makes you complicit in their evil. This is something that the left really pushes, is that you need to get personally involved in fighting these oppressive evil norms. More recently, this has evolved uh, to the point, you know, in the context of these George Floyd-related riots, uh, to saying that even outside of your personal life, even if you don't know anyone who's perpetuating these norms, you need to get out and protest. And if you're a company, you need to issue statements supporting the protest. And again, uh, silence is just not okay. Inaction is not okay. You need to get personally involved in fighting for your ideological commitments. Of course, these are just trends. They're not universal characteristics of all of the rhetoric on the right and the left. But these are 
nonetheless real trends, and I think that they'll be not that controversial among the kind of people that'll be watching this video, so I'm not going to try to somehow prove that these are trends. To anyone who watches American political discourse, I think this is just reasonably obvious. Now, the result of this has to do with uh, you know, social justice warriors and the like, because the left tells people that you need to get actively personally involved, and the other side is evil. And so, you're going to be harassed if you hold right-wing views openly. You're going to be harassed personally, uh, by your family, by your friends, by your co-workers, uh, and by your boss when he fires you, or uh, by a school when they tell you that you, know, you have to leave. By contrast, openly holding left-wing views is not going to get you harassed in the same way. Forget harassment, oftentimes right-wingers, because they're scared of being harassed, won't even openly argue with you about their views. And I think, you know, we have all probably known people who have done this or have done this ourselves where uh, because we feel like the left is going to react to us in a very harsh way if we are openly right wing, we just don't say anything. Or maybe even we pretend to agree with people expressing left wing views. Certainly, we don't try to get people fired. We don't call them evil. We don't argue in such a way that we're expressing a great deal of moral indignation at what they're saying because right wingers are not socialized to argue with people in that way and to confront people and to seek out conflict and they're not socialized to think that the other side is fundamentally evil. Now this creates a problem owing to fairly obvious observations in social psychology having to deal with how people form moral and political views. So people form political views largely for social reasons. You can look at people uh, and notice how they act when they're trying to make sure they form a true view. So think about someone trying to decide what house to buy, uh, think about someone trying to react to a medical diagnosis. You know, they'll look at multiple houses. They will uh, get second and third opinions on a diagnosis. They really care about the validity of the source that they're getting their information from. Or think about even a more concrete example, people trying to decide how to get somewhere with directions, right? The focus in all of these cases very clearly is on just what is reality. Right. What are these houses actually like? What medical condition do I actually have? How do you actually get to this place? If you think about any feature of the discourse about these things, that is very clearly the focus. By contrast, everyone knows people form political views in very biased ways. They don't even try to hear out the other side. They don't think in rational ways. And it's not because these people can't understand rationality. It's not because everyone is just an idiot everywhere in their life. It's because in this context, they're not trying to form the most rational view. And for very rational reasons, actually, formally speaking. So you know, there's this very well-known problem having to do with the logic of democracy where you can ask the question, uh, what is the benefit someone gets to having a correct political view? Well, given that they're one of several hundred million votes, it has almost no effect on the actual policy. And so there's almost no practical benefit to forming the correct political view. By contrast, forming the political view that is socially beneficial, as opposed to one that is socially not beneficial, socially damaging, that has a very large benefit. And so from the individual's perspective, they're going to get a lot more benefit from taking on the socially beneficial view than trying to form a view which is particularly true. And that is why, obviously, people want to think their political views are true. So they create some kind of rationale for them, but they don't go around testing them, trying to think of reasons to be uncertain in them, and acting like they would if they were just trying to form the truest views they could. To relate this back to the right versus left thing, hopefully it is obvious the problem here then is that there are strong social incentives to be a left winger because if you're not, you'll be harassed and there are not equal incentives to be a right winger. And if social incentives play a pretty large role in how people form political views, then this is a pretty large disadvantage. And so the right can't win unless it has an equally large advantage in some other area that makes up for this, an advantage over the left. Uh, and in many cases, such as race, there is just no such advantage. And so it loses. Now, I should note that if you read conservatives uh, of the past, I don't think anyone really says this anymore, but in the past anyway, and maybe some people still say this, they used to say this thing. They say, look, uh, the left is being really mean, really rude, obnoxious, and extreme. And people will see this, and then they'll hate the left, and they'll come over to our side. And that was an idea. And then history happened, and the right lost on almost all the cultural issues. And so I think we can pretty safely say that that was just completely and totally wrong. A secondary problem that comes out of all of this is that right-wing ideology is not existentially meaningful. And what I mean by that is exactly what it sounds like. Right-wing ideology doesn't give you a reason to orient your life around the way that left-wing ideology does, because you're not fighting evil. And even if you are fighting evil, all you're supposed to do about it is vote. You're not supposed to actually engage with conflict with evil in your everyday life. The result of this, I mean, there are many results of this. 
for one thing, right-wing ideology is less psychologically attractive, especially to people that lack meaning, but also just generally speaking. And moreover, it's less worthy of personal sacrifice and extremism, because fundamentally it's just an idea. It's not a reason to orient your life around it. It's not that you're involved in this great fight against evil, for which personal sacrifice is justified. It's just, look, I'd like my taxes to be a little lower. Uh, maybe they're not. Oh well. And this sets up a systematic disadvantage uh, versus the left, because the left does attract people who need a sense of meaning, and it has then advocates who are tied to the ideology in this very personal, almost religious kind of way. And I think this very obviously is deeply connected to the sort of people who become uh, so-called social justice warriors and who basically harass people over their leftist politics. Now, I want to note in passing that right-wingers sometimes talk about this. Uh, Jordan Peterson has talked a lot about this, this idea and, and says that it's good, basically, that right-wing ideology does not give people meaning to a high degree because you want to find your sense of meaning outside of politics. And a lot of classically liberal-oriented people want to say this. And... They point to the 20th century, they talk about Nazism and Communism as examples of ideologies that gave people a strong sense of meaning. And they say that because people were wrapped up in this moralistic ideology, they were willing to do things that we look back on with horror. And of course, that is uh, true to a degree. I mean, the reason we look back on these things with horror is largely because they lost, like at a military and economic level. But it does make people willing to do extreme things. Like I said, th the problem is that the left-wingers of the world don't care what people like Jordan Peterson say. And so what you end up with then is, again, this asymmetry. You, you can say it would be nice to live in a world where people did not need to be religiously committed to political ideals, or any ideals for that matter. It doesn't need to be political. Look at the history of the world. Just plain old religion can lead to people doing very extreme things as well. Now, you, know, you can say that in an ideal world, people would get very ideological only about, uh, you know, things like what Jordan Peterson says, sort of, you frame in your mind cleaning your room as if that's a great fight against evil you're slaying the dragon or whatever uh, and that's you know is that true is that false is that the best thing who cares fundamentally because because at the end of the day the right exists in a world where the left has religious fanatics and so not having its own religious fanatics puts it at a systematic disadvantage and if the right commits itself to this idea that you don't want to have people getting their sense of meaning from politics and then because of that, doesn't have the fanatics. And so because of that, in turn, loses. Then guess what? The world is still going to be dominated by an ideology that is full of religious fanatics. And fundamentally, there's not a good reason to think, at least no obvious reason to think, that in the long run, that's not just sort of a necessary condition or at least something that's very probable. That ideologies that inspire the kind of fanaticism, at least among a minority of people, that then govern the behavior of everyone else, uh, that those sorts of ideologies, there are obvious reasons to think, tend to win. And so I think from the right-wing perspective, the question is, would we rather be governed by a right-wing ideology, which inspires a kind of fanaticism among some subset of people, or a left-wing ideology that inspires a fanaticism among a subset of people? And if that is the question, well, then obviously, if you, your politics tend to lean to the right, then you're going to favor the right. And the burden of proof should be on people like Jordan Peterson and other classical liberals to justify the view that we can reasonably hope for something in the long run which is better than people being fanatical about ideals that are fundamentally good and true. Now briefly, it seems proper to put this argument in historical context because it has clear historical analogs. So, for one thing, Karl Popper very famously argued that in a liberal democracy, if you are tolerant of people who are intolerant, well, as soon as those people gain some kind of institutional power, uh, it'll stop being a liberal democracy. Carl Schmitt saw this kind of concern as an argument against the long-term viability of democracy itself, because he basically because he basically argued that the logic of democracy was such that it was predictable that it was going to tell its populace that internal disagreements should not be framed in moral terms. Now, it's important that I am talking about internal disagreements. If we're talking about democracies, conflicts with other systems, fascism, communism, etc., those when those conflicts are external they are framed in extremely moralistic terms. And during that period, we might not run into some of the problems that I've described thus far. So, for instance, politics will offer people a kind of meaning in life, but an issue will arise, potentially, even if democracy has not defeated its external enemies, but especially in a world where democracy is basically won. Because in that world, 
the entire society of a liberal democracy will be demoralized in a sense because there will no longer be these external enemies to focus on and internally a democracy does not want its citizens to morally oppose each other because if one side is fundamentally evil and it's not just a disagreement among respectable citizens well then why would you leave that up to a vote why would you not engage in a kind of violent struggle against a vote should it go the wrong way if what's on the line is the fight against good and evil and so it was argued that it is in the logic of democracy that if it ever was to win then society would become demoralized in this way but of course either because of groups coming in via immigration who were not socialized into these democratic norms or because of groups within a country that were otherized for some other more long-lasting reason there will be certain groups who do not internalize these norms and they will fight against the people of the democracy in a kind of moralistic and religious way and they will not be fought back and they will not be fought back against at the same intensity and in the long run this will tend to undermine the system now in both cases i am obviously simplifying a great deal and being very concise and short in describing these arguments but even just explaining the very basic gist of them i think you come to see that the concerns that i'm raising about the modern american right were eminently predictable as evidenced by the fact that they were literally predicted and commonly talked about in the political philosophy of the first half of the 20th century and for the purposes of this video i'm just going to note that it is an issue and then totally ignore this concern about whether or not i am pointing out something that is problematic about the current american right or whether or not this was predictable because it's something more fundamentally wrong with the kind of political society uh, that exists today but sticking with this talking about history uh, it's not true anymore but just back in 2009 most white americans did not think that we needed to somehow give black people more rights in this country back in 1990 white people would say things like that black people were not as intelligent or hardworking as white people majority of whites said that they would also tell pollsters that they would oppose living in a neighborhood that was primarily black and they would oppose a relative of theirs marrying a black and you go back to the 80s or the 70s and it's pretty overwhelming the opposition to interracial marriage now the point i want to make here is that on the one hand our society in the 70s and 80s was very capable of ginning up extreme moralistic politics we can see this because we did it with respect to the soviet union right this external threat but internally right in 1985 or 1990 being okay with interracial marriage and saying so was not something that would get you attacked and socially ostracized and the powerful institutions of society would not turn against you in the way that today they would if you said that you opposed interracial marriage and hopefully that highlights in people's minds the contrast between what the right does and what the left does the right set up conditions of intolerance but with respect to these kind of external disagreements they did not set up a context of extreme fanaticism and intolerance with respect to domestic affairs like race relations by contrast the left does not care about this distinction between external and internal and it is setting up very intolerant norms with respect to these internal disagreements now look obviously for a lot of people conflict just fundamentally is not fun and in the short run people's lives for the most part are fine part of the reason that conflict is hard from the perspective of the right is that at this point with respect to an issue like race we're in the minority but the fact is the left began uh, frankly harassing people over its views when it was in the minority uh, and the right is going to probably lose if it doesn't do the same and the longer the right waits the harder this will be and you can say look uh, my life is fine but eventually these problems are going to come to you one way or the other right it's either going to come to you because you participate in a strategy by which the right turns things around or it's going to come to you because the right is going to totally fail and the kind of mass discrimination against white people with respect to educational opportunity and employment opportunity is going to increase the limit on people's free speech is going to increase and the redistribution of resources from white people to black people via the state is going to increase setting aside things like disbanding police forces and violence which may also be a significant part of the future and so the takeaway here, I think, is that if we want to increase the probability of right-wing ideology winning, right-wing ideology needs to become more existentially meaningful, and it needs to give people more in the way of ways to fight evil. It needs to frame things in terms of good and evil. And as a result of this, it needs to become more okay with judgment and, quite frankly, hate. Because, of course, people naturally hate evil. 
Now, some issues do lend themselves more naturally to moralistic framing than others, but this can be done with almost anything. Uh, people talk about economics not being something that can be morally framed very easily, but, I mean, really, it can. You can talk about the evils of communism if you want to make that your thing. I'm not suggesting the right should do that. Obviously, I think that race needs to be a big part of right-wing ideology, but you can talk about uh, communism as the thing, so to speak, and you could paint it as this evil system that killed millions and millions of people, and the people that are here today are trying to institute a similar system, and then you can point out to people, look, this is not just a disagreement about the marginal tax rate. This is about a system that really is fundamentally evil. The people pushing it are fundamentally evil, and you need to act like you are dealing with people who are evil. You need to never back away from conflict with these people. If one of your friends or a family member or a co-worker supports this ideology, realize they're supporting an ideology that leads to the mass death of people. It's as serious as it could be. These are bad people. You need to confront them. Right. This is not how the right typically talks about the economic ideology, but in theory, my point is they could, uh, and you can definitely do this with various cultural and social issues that lend it themselves more naturally to this kind of framing. And importantly, you have to not only say that the thing is evil, but you then have to encourage people to act like it actually is evil. Right. Like The right does this thing where they frame abortion as if it's murder and it's evil, but then tell people, but don't act like it's murder. Now, this is just an example because, in fact, I don't have a right-wing view on abortion, but if I did, I would want people to actually act like uh, abortion was murder. Not just to say it, and not to just treat it as a respectable disagreement, these people that are in favor of murdering millions of children. Now, aside from this framing, telling people the other side is evil, and to act like they're evil, uh, there have to be internal social norms, such that people are incentivized to confront people, that that's looked at as something that people are expected to do, they get a kind of social esteem from doing it, but probably even more importantly, that people are socially punished, frankly, for not doing this, for being cowardly. You know, if two right-wingers are together and one tells the other about, oh, you know, my family member, my friend, they said this horrible thing, crazy leftist thing, and the story ends with, and I was mad but I didn't say anything, well, then people should have a problem with that because that's part of the reason why the right is losing. And so the right would need to actually put pressure, and by the right I mean everyone in the right, so collectively people would need to put pressure on everyone else to actually do this and confront people. And obviously, it doesn't have to be confronting people in the most hysterical sort of way, right? But even at the level of just, if you hear someone saying a leftist thing and it's someone you're close to, just confronting them directly in a civil way of saying, hey, uh, you said this thing. I think this is wrong. Not only do I think this is wrong, I think that this helps to perpetuate a system which, which is fundamentally evil, that you're participating in evil by supporting it, and this is fundamentally not okay, right? And... Even that kind of confrontation, which is not the same as just telling someone you're a fucking racist and you know, screaming at them in that sort of way, that kind of confrontation would definitely be a step in the right direction and maybe all that is needed. But it's more than what people commonly are doing now. And notice that I said close associations. Uh, the right currently does not socialize people into doing this even with their close associations, even with their family members and friends, let alone co-workers and strangers. The co-workers and strangers thing, I mean, look, that's what the left does. So if you want the right to win, that has to be ultimately where this kind of thing would go. But, you know, a first step would be friends and family. And people say, oh, well, but my friends and my family won't even associate with me if I say these things. And first of all, you can say, okay, but that's the reason why you're going to lose. And are you okay with that? Are you okay with society uh, falling to left-wing ideology because you're afraid of losing a friend or a family member? Secondly, are you sure? I think a lot of times people overestimate that kind of response in people. And then thirdly... Do you really even want to have close relationships with people that would hate you if they knew who you really were? What kind of relationship even is that? And I'm calling these close relationships, that kind of relationship, they're not actually close to you. They're close to a fake character you play. Because again, if they knew who you really were, they'd hate you and wouldn't even talk to you, apparently. And then thirdly, you know, you're so worried about offending them, why aren't they offending you? Why isn't it offensive to you that your friend, A, supports an ideology, which, let's take race, uh, is promotes the hatred of you based on your race, and then secondly, that your friend is so bigoted about it that if you told him that you oppose an ideology which hates you because of your race, they wouldn't even talk to you anymore. Why would you want to be friends with someone like that? Now, with family, I understand it's a bit more complicated, but again, look, at the end of the day, am I telling people they have to do this? Of course not, because for one thing, no one would listen to me, and for another thing, people don't have to do this. I'm just pointing out as a descriptive matter of fact that people not doing this and, not be, and the right not beginning to move in this direction is going to decrease the chances of its victory 
in the long run. And as I tried to impress at the beginning of this video, just taking race as an example, the actual result of loss is serious. So at the very least, it's something that people I think should seriously consider. You know, the right is going to lose as it's going now. Obviously, if we, current, if we continue down the current trajectory, the right is going to lose. The things people could do to make it less likely that it would lose, maybe it's not worth doing those things, but at least I think it's worth you know, seriously considering what those things are and what they would look like. And if people do want to consider doing this kind of thing, obviously the details can vary from individual to individual, and I have not been detailed here. This is an argument about, broadly speaking, one of the causes of the right's failure. It's not a how-to guide. That being said, if you want a how-to guide, the left has already made one for you, because what we're talking about fundamentally is treating the left the way the left treats the right. So, And so you see the left calling out people in various ways. You see them threatening to disassociate with people if they hold on to views that they consider morally illegitimate. You see them trying to get these people punished by attacking other people they associate with in an employment or an educational context, you know, institutions and the like putting pressure on them to punish the individual for expressing the immoral view. Now, some of these things don't make perfect sense for the right to do because of real-world factors that differ, but the best how-to guide there is, at least as a starting point, is in fact just the behavior of the left. But like I said, a detailed how-to guide is not the point of this video. It's just about me expressing some thoughts about why the right is losing, and hopefully you enjoy them.